Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David Smith. I'll try and race through some of this, just to give you a bit of background information. I'm the manager of Norm UK. Um, Norm UK is a UK charity. It was founded in 1995 when a group of men met in a flat in London and decided something needed to be needed to be done to help those affected, um, either physically or psychologically through circumcision. It became a registered UK charity in 1998 and it was the first charity application in the history of the Charity Commission to have inquiries because they said we were racist, or some objectors said we were racist. I'm also the Chief Officer of Genital Autonomy. Uh, Genital Autonomy was founded in 2008. Um, it's, the issues with promoting male circumcision were very similar to FGM and intersex, and they all faced similar problems. And it was decided by uniting the three strands, uh, all of which suffered from genital mutilation, it made the topic easier uh, for the public to understand. And the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child provided a human rights framework within which to operate. So there was no contest that FGM was worse than MGM. But as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter. Uh, it's, it's all the same. That's what we're working towards. Um, initially, we saw male circumcision like a three-legged stool. Three legs keep a stool very firm. And we decided that the three legs of the stool were the medical issues, the social issues, and the religious issues. And we decided um, in 1995 that the religious issue, it had to be tackled within members of that, those communities that practiced. We couldn't really get involved in that. But we, we could start to knock some of the other legs off the stool. So um, we, um, we started with the medical. We decided if we could knock the medical leg off the stool, the social would crumble and then we would be, it would leave a, a very shaky stool. Uh, but initially we made a marketing mistake. We put too much emphasis on foreskin restoration and not enough on the prevention of unnecessary circumcision for the future. So we were dwelling too much on people being victims and not enough positive moving forward. We, we, we learned that mistake very quickly. Um, Victor Schoenfeld, I, I've put here, this is a name to watch because um, he appeared in 1995 and um, he approached us at Norm UK and said he wanted to make a film about male circumcision. And he was a Jewish filmmaker who was forced into, by family pressure, to having his son circumcised and he regretted it and he wanted to make a film. Um, and It's a Boy, um, the, the end film was voted Programme of the Year by the Independent on Sunday and it was a, a Channel 4 documentary. And we were involved, in, and I personally was involved in the research for that film. Um, the reactions to the film, when it was actually made and they were going to show it, a lot of Jewish organisations tried to stop it appearing and they created a lot of publicity but it had the opposite effect to the publicity that they were trying to, to get. It actually gave more viewers to the film. Um, when Victor was showing the procedure and if there was, if God, if um, the hand of God um, was, was, against, uh, was against Victor, he didn't show it because while they were filming the procedure it started to go wrong and the child ended up in intensive care in hospital and they didn't know whether the child was going to live. So you can imagine the impact that film had. Um, and viewers were shocked by the film. Nobody realised, I don't think in the UK it was done without anaesthetic. They didn't know, I think most people in the UK just thought it was something that religious people did, but it didn't do any harm. Um, and we were allowed to give contact details for Norm UK at the end of the film, and it just exploded the organisation. All of a sudden, people were contacting us, in, which was a major panic because we hadn't got any material to hand out. But it meant more inquiries, more support, more <coughs> publicity for both the subject and Norm UK. Um, but the best outcome from the film, it started the debate in the UK, which we've never been able to achieve. All of a sudden, it was, it was in all the newspapers. Now, um, 
I've mentioned uh, Victor, but I want you to keep Victor in mind. If you haven't seen the Victor's film, it's one of the best tools still. I know it's 1995, and Victor sort of faded into oblivion for a while. Um, but we sort of struggled on for a number of years, but it was really the Cologne ruling that started the debate in Europe. And by default, it actually reignited the debate in the UK, which we've been trying to keep, uh, keep a profile on. Um, the reaction to the Cologne ruling, um, and, and it's a familiar story, think about the It's a Boy, religious objections to it, it's racist, but it gave it more publicity. Angela Merkel panicked, she, she pushed through emergency uh, measures to reverse the ruling, but that angered the public, and it was the start of the formation of acti activist groups in uh, Germany. It was also the start of a very busy period for us because people in Germany were starting to contact us for information on how to start various organisations. Um, Victor Schoenfeld suddenly reappeared. He'd gone for about 10 years, nobody heard from him, and he said he'd done his bit and you know, he thought that that was the end of it. Um, he re-released It's a Boy, and he phoned me and he said, I would like to send a copy of It's a Boy to every member of the German Parliament. So um, he asked for if, we could, if we could find uh, donations to subtitle a film into German. And one of our members was very generous, and within three days the film had reappeared with German subtitles. And a copy was sent to every member of the Bundestag. Um, we then came to the, the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe were a bit irritated that Merkel had pushed through this legislation. And um, Marlene Ruprecht started to gather information following Cologne. And she, it did, she invited Victor Schoenfeld to Strasbourg. So I had very many more conversations with Victor uh, on what to say, because by this time he'd gone out and he wanted to reacquaint himself. And she also contacted Paul Mason, who at that time was the ex-Tasmanian Commissioner for Children and who had made a great impact. Paul Mason actually came all the way over from Tasmania to speak at one of our conferences. We had an international symposium at Kiel in 2008. And Paul really um, became a an activist. I'd only met him for three days and within, four, within three days we'd, uh, we talked about starting a new formation, uh, a new charity which was Genital Autonomy. Um, they also contacted the Child Rights Information Network, CRIN, uh, which I didn't know, but CRIN is a very powerful organisation in the UK dealing with children's rights. And CRIN also involved Norm UK and genital uh, autonomy in these discussions. So there were a lot, while they appeared to be very quiet, there were a lot of information gathering talks going on in the background that I think the public were not aware of. Um, in 2013, we held a conference at Keele University in Staffordshire, which is very near our headquarters. Keele University in Staffordshire was, um, we chose that for conference in 2008 because it was a university that had done research on the legality of male circumcision. And Professors Fox and Thompson of Keele, um, their conclusion was that it wasn't legal. So we, we've held a lot of conferences at Keele University ever since, which coincidentally is only 10 miles from my home and our headquarters. So it's, it was so um, we held a, um, a symposium in um, Helsinki in 2012, as I've just been saying. And Anne Limbo was invited by Paul Mason to come and speak. So we first met Anne Limbo in Helsinki and she said that she was wanting to, uh, to work on this issue and um, she told us to, uh, to stay alert for further developments. And she came again. We held another two-day conference at Kiel last, um, last September, October. And Anne Limbo actually came again and spoke. And she said that um, we've got to keep our eyes on the press because in the next few days she'll be making a statement. And I think she actually, her closing statement, this is war! <laughs> um, and sure enough, on the 30th of September, the, as you all know, the joint statement from the Nordic Ombudsman was, was issued. 
And that was two days before the Council of, uh, of Europe conference that took part, took part. I was watching that conference live streaming, knowing that I had some input. And um, I, I was sitting in my office and I was sort of screaming at the, at, at the, when I saw all the debate. And I was very surprised actually that the vote went in favour. I, I really thought that it would be defeated. Um, but, it, but it did go through, so the issue had to be debated. Um, the Nordic Association for Clinical Sexology um, issued a statement that they supported two recent resolutions on non-therapeutic circumcision of boys issued by the Nordic Ombudsman for Children and the Parliamentary Assembly for the Council of Europe. So that really gave the two. I, I don't know whether, I, I don't think it was coincidental that the Nordic statement was issued two days before the, um, I think there was a lot of um, discussions on that beforehand. Um, but that started the increase of intactivism in Germany. I, I don't like this word intactivism because it, it, intactivism is a term that's used for people um, opposed to male circumcision. I prefer, I don't like to be called an intactivist. I'm an activist. I'm an activist for genital autonomy. I don't single out any, any sex. It's, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're all the same. Um, it's, there were also a lot of um, demonstrations happening in, in Germany following the Merkel ruling and some new organisations started. I already knew some of the activists in Germany and knew that they were planning things, but they, they, they took their time, they, um, they did a lot of planning. Um, this was a, a demonstration in front of the Brandenburg Gate, uh, My Body Belongs to Me, in September 2012. It was a very powerful demonstration. Uh, the other demonstration in Germany um, was the Bloodstained Men. Now, they, um, they demonstrated in Cologne on the first anniversary of the Cologne Judgment. Um, that picture gives quite a bit of impact. You need to see the demonstration on YouTube because the sound, they have the sound of a, of a screaming baby being circumcised. And in turn, each one turns uh, to face it. It is a very, very powerful demonstration. Um, one of the Norm Committee members, who is now the Chairman of Genital Autonomy, um, he devised the Bloodstained Men costume. It's, it's become a, um, a massive campaigning tool. Since it's very effective, all you've got to do is a white overall, and it, it gives the message without anybody saying anything. So that was the start of demonstrations. There is another demonstration planned this year for the next anniversary. I'm hoping to go over uh, to attend that demonstration. Um, there's some new organisations. Uh, this one is the newest. And we've had, a, th this was started by uh, a keen campaigner called Michael Bayer. She's a real dynamo. She stays very much in the background, but she, the information, she's an absolute mine of information. She's been studying this issue for about 10 years, and she has now started a new organisation, and I, I think that is a name to watch. Um, Mogis, is, I don't think it's a new organisation, and I'm not quite sure what Mogis is, uh, but it's that's another... Uh, German organisation that is becoming very vocal. They are taking this issue seriously. And um, Mogis issued a press release. Um, child protection NGOs and paediatricians, uh, they, they concluded that circumcision law has, has failed. It was, it was quite a good uh, press release. But Denmark has stepped up the activity. In our, in our conference last year, we had uh, in, se in September, we had a, uh, a really remarkable lady called Lena Nebus, who uh, was single handedly spearheading the campaign in Denmark. And uh, she has been an absolute powerhouse. She's a name to watch for the future. And she's formed a charity called Intact Denmark. Uh, we have another very ardent campaigner in Denmark called Morton Frisch. Another name I think will be appearing very, um, very soon. 
Um, the Danish Society of Family Physicians issued a statement that circumcision without medical indication is mutilation. And I put here Morton Frisch, who is a professional of sexual health, became an active campaigner. Uh, this morning, uh, as I was preparing for this, I, I opened my emails and there was a statement that's been issued yesterday from, um, from Denmark. If I've got time, I'll read it. If not, we can, we can show it in the... Uh, I, I can go over it with anybody in the interval. But there's been a very powerful statement issued from Denmark this morning. Um, I've had to translate it using Google Translate into, into English, so I'm, I'm hope, I hope it, it reads well. But um, also, there's been a press release in Denmark, so the issue is really taking on. And I personally think that Denmark will be the first country to instigate a ban. I'm, I'm honestly convinced that Denmark will be the leader. And I think once one starts, the rest will go. Um, the Council of Europe, they are, they are gearing up for the next round of the fight. And they've invited Victor Schoenfeld to Strasbourg for more discussions. So um, Victor is, is, I think that they, they're going to use the film again. It's, the, it's, still, it's, it's still the best tool, and it's now available to view. So you, you can download it. I strongly recommend that you, if any of you campaign, it's the real, it's the real tool to use. Uh, Crin is involved as well, again, and also Paul Mason, so by default we are involved. Um, they've also invited Ronald Goldman to Strasbourg from the USA. Now Ronald Goldman is a Jewish psychologist and he wrote quite a few years ago a book called Circumcision, the Hidden Trauma. It, Circumcision, the Hidden Trauma details the psychological damage it's a very, it's, al it's an almost impossible book for anybody who's been damaged by circumcision to read. Uh, it's the sort that people have to read in chunks because it, it, it just brings home the real damage. So I think that the Council of Europe are really doing their homework on this and they are, um, they're, they're ready for the next round. Um, the opposition, I believe the Knesset are, are submitting a, a film uh, to, in evidence to the uh, Council of Europe. Now, Victor Schoenfeld shows a, a screaming child who then ends up in, in intensive care. I don't know what this film is. Probably shows a, a baby who's smiling through the whole procedure. I really don't know. Um, I just dread to think. But the opposition are using USA studies of health benefits. Our biggest, um, our biggest headache is the USA. And as soon as we make progress in, in Europe, the USA seems to undermine it. And I think it was last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a statement that routine neonatal circumcision may give some health benefits, so it was okay if parents wanted to do it. So of course that's given ammunition to our opponents who were saying, well, it's the, the USA are recommending it, and it's a, it's a healthy thing to do. And they're using the studies that they did in Africa uh, that HIV is sort of sometimes, well, I think there's a 60% pre prevention if you've been circumcised. The fact that America has a very high circumcision male population and it has a very high circumcised, uh, has a very high rate of HIV uh, seems to speak for itself. And countries like Finland have a low circumcision rate and a low HIV rate. But, Nonetheless, they are grabbing on to all these sorts of lifelines. It's like a straw as they're going down. But the end results, if the Council of Europe stick to their guns, non-therapeutic surgery should not be carried out on minors, and that's the criteria they need to stick to. No child of eight days old is, um, is at danger of, of getting a sexually transmitted infection. And when, when they're old enough to decide that they, they want to have sexual relations, if they think circumcision is going to protect them, then fine, they can do it. But I think that they need to stick to their guns. Um, I'll quickly cover activism in the UK. Um, I can, no need to, but it, it, you might like to just know what's happening. There are several organisations in the UK. Norm UK, we're carrying on, we're restructuring it, we're giving it a new name. Um, the Secular Medical Forum, that's an, that's an association of doctors who are, and they're, they're linked to the secular, National Secular Society, 
and they are trying to separate the religion. The doctor is religious and shouldn't inflict that religious belief on a child who doesn't, so the family doesn't share that belief. Uh, that's Dr. Anthony Lampert, who's the chair of the Secular Medical Forum. He's also a dynamo, he's a great debater. Um, activism in the UK, the National Secular Society uh, the, and the British Humanist Association, Anthony Lampert is dragging those two screaming and kicking into the debate. They didn't really want to become involved, but I think they're now having to. <laughs> uh, the Men's Network, that's, um, um, that's a men's rights issue um, network. They have a Facebook page, an online petition, and they're very supportive. So the message is coming from several different um, angles in the UK, and um, men do complain. That's formed by Richard Duncan, who invented the men, uh, the bloodstained men, idea and they hold demonstrations and that's a victim you know activist they like to go and hold placards bloodstained men there again that's richard that's a really good one she's protected he isn't um and of course genital autonomy a personal choice and that's the we are um trying to grow genital autonomy it's been it's been sort of treading water for a while but i think now it's going to grow um, it's based in the UK, it was registered as a charity in 2010, and it's taking steps to create interlinked partner organisations. And we now have the, the Austral-Asian Institute for Genital Autonomy, and it's now active under the chairmanship of Paul Mason. Um, and that's their work, so it uses the same basic symbol, which is the international child, um, which is the symbol I have on here. And, um, the idea emerged at the planning meeting following the Kiel conference in September 2013 for GA Legal. Um, future events. I'll finish by giving you some details of future events. We're holding a symposium in Boulder, Colorado um, in July next year. And I'm pleased to say that the issue that we... I'm looking at the abstracts, I'm on the committee and we've got some fantastic abstracts for people working on all three strands of activism, male, female, and intersex. It's a three-day event, I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a biggie. An anniversary protest in Cologne, and we've possibly got a conference in Copenhagen in October. Uh, I think because Denmark is, is making such progress, there's been, there's been a um, request to hold a conference, so I'm looking towards into Copenhagen in October. I'm happy to answer any questions in the interval if anybody wants to, uh, to ask me anything, but thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for listening.